How can we get peace with God and understand what He wants from us? That's what we'll talk about today. God cannot give us happiness and peace apart from Himself because it is not there. There is no such thing. C.S. Lewis Today we're going to talk about the book, Peace with God, by Billy Graham. This was written in 1953, and then he updated it in 1984. I have to say that after reading this book, I found it incredible. I had no idea. I've never read Billy Graham before, but it is basically a textbook on what God expects from us and how we can have peace with ourselves, peace with other people, and peace with God. I ended up really enjoying this book, and I want to spend a little bit more time with it. The book starts off saying that we've been on a quest our whole lives, the moment we were born, to find what God wants from us. We're trying to find out how this world works. We're trying to figure out what it is we're supposed to be doing. And he says that at times it can make us feel lonely. It can make us wonder if we're going in the right direction and that maybe we're just stumbling along, he says, in the dark. We live in, he says, what is an age of anxiety, which is interesting because this was 1953. Think of atomic bombs, war, just got over World War II in under a decade from the time this book was originally written. And then it was 1984, and there was all sorts of threats with the Soviets and war and other problems. We had just gotten out of a deep recession that ended somewhere like, I think, in 81, 82. And people were wondering, are my children going to live as good a life as I lived? And I think we're thinking about those same things now. We have so many things going on that feel out of our control. And it's hard to know which way to turn or if we're on the correct path. Sometimes we feel like we've been on the wrong path. But the choices we have might lead us to the wrong path. We can get into politics, and I think it's good for us as citizens to be informed, vote, those types of civic activities, volunteer at voting stations. But it's not the solution. It makes our lives better or worse. You know, things happen because of the elections. And in the end, though, it's not exactly what this planet needs, what our path is about. It is part of the path, but it is not where we put all our eggs. Politics is not where we were put on this planet to work on. We are here for the message of God and to be a part of the message of God and to be a part of the community of God. Politics, it's a necessary evil, I guess, like taxes and that, but it shouldn't be the focus. And I feel like even among Christians, it has somehow become a focus of people. If we don't do this or do that, this is the end of Christianity. Do you really think our faith is so weak and our God so little that a single election is going to end faith on this planet from Jesus? Man, I don't think so. And there's all sorts of ways that we try. And he mentions the seduction of science. I like science. I was in astrophysics. I love science. I'm very invested in it. But again, it is not the answer to everything. It's going to help cure some diseases. It's going to make our lives better in some ways. We've seen how computer science has made computers more interesting or maybe more of a threat. We're not going to find a cure for every illness, even though doctors are working diligently to do just that. So while science is also a good tool for improving or maybe not improving our lives, we have to realize that in the end, it's not the solution to this planet. Jesus Christ is the only, in the end, solution we have. We have to know where we came from. We have to know what we're supposed to do. And we have to know where we're going. Someone said in one of my classes in college, those are three of the four signs of religion and faith, is that you came from a place, you're supposed to act in a way, you're going to end up someplace, and then comes how do you worship, those four things. And again, science and politics never going to answer any of those questions. And those are the ones that matter the most. In some ways, he was saying that we've crammed ourselves full of knowledge. 
which nothing wrong with knowledge. And we decided we're going to live our best selves and go out there and do these things. But somehow people are more bored than ever. People are lost more than ever. And people seem unhappy, like they don't have a direction. Even though we have tools at our fingertips that can enable us to do the most amazing things, people don't strike me as happier. These solutions that come into our world and they don't provide any answers for us. And then we have the whole issue of God versus Satan, that God is trying to bring us into his path, bring us into peace, and Satan is trying to do everything he can to rule over the nations, but that also means make things worse and bring us down the wrong path. So in the end, the best that we've tried to do to make the world a better place, sometimes we find is not a better place. And we also personally make mistakes, make errors, go the wrong direction. And we try in so many ways to avoid woe in our life, avoid death. We try to cleanse death so that we make it pretty, so that we soften it, he says, so it's not so stark. But in the end, it's where we all go. The wage of sin is death. But the question is, is what happens after that? And who has paid that wage of sin in his death? That's where we're going to talk about Jesus. So Christ came to be our answer so that we know with no uncertainty where our end is going to be. We're going to end up with God and we won't have end. We are immortal beings and we just have to know that Jesus is the pathway to having that role in heaven as compared to the other places. Everyone's going to be immortal. It's just a matter of where you go. And so God created the Bible so we would have a book. We would have something to refer to. We would have his wisdom and his stories and that the Bible can be a guide point to us so that when we see dark times or we may be frightened, we see a light. The Bible is so honest to me. I thought, because my dad told me so, that the Bible was a propaganda piece for a bunch of people living in Israel at a time to show how great they were. Well, if that's the truth, they did a really horrible job because it's very honest how the apostles, the people of the Bible, weren't that great. They had doubts. They did horrible things like David, like Abraham. But yet God used them in a way to bring his message to us. And so it's so honest because nobody walks away great from the Bible. They all had their points where it didn't go well for them. And so it's a way that we can see light in our own lives when things don't go so well, or maybe we don't go so well and we don't do the things we're supposed to do. So the Bible is there for us to be that pillar. At the time, you know, in the Bible were being written, you had kings, you had prophets, you then eventually had Jesus and apostles. But now the Bible is what we have as our guidepost. And I call it our map, our owner's manual, because it's telling us how to act, how not to act, and what we should do in many different circumstances. It, he says, embodies all knowledge man needs to fill the longing of his soul and solve his problems. It is a blueprint of the master architect. And only by following its directions, we can build the life we are seeking. That's what Billy Graham says. I like that. And I thought that was so comforting that we have that ability to do it. He says a lot of times that we can look in the pages and hold them up as mirrors. There are times when you feel like Jacob, who was given a promise, but screwed it up. He tried to make his own promise come true. And then in the end, Jesus shows us the way for peace everlasting how we can have the things that we're looking for for all times. That is, in the end, the message Jesus is trying to get to us, is how can we go on? He answers a question about what is God like? How do we know his nature? I think sometimes, I grew up Jewish, God felt hard to know. He rumbled the mountains. He brought the fire. He took out Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, these things that are strong messages. But, you know, I think learning the side of God 
that Jesus brings of kindness, of love, of looking in your soul and finding out that hurt you have. He gives a quote from Benjamin Franklin, quote, I have lived a long time and the longer I live, the more convincing proof I see that God governs the affairs of men. Blaise Pascal, he says, wrote, if a man is not made for God, why is he happy only in God? If a man is made for God, why is he opposed to God? Why do we keep fighting him? Why is it that we see so many people trying to end God, trying to end his time? And they'll say, oh, it's because of the Crusades or this happened or that happened. That's not God. That's us taking the message of God and going the wrong way with it. To say that I want to end people behaving badly because of God, that's a whole other thing. But instead, they want to end God. They want to end the place of forgiveness. They want to end the everlasting life. And they say, oh, well, it's because you're deluded. I'm trying to end your delusion. And some podcast, but someone asked him, well, do you wish it's true that we have a God? and that heaven is our home? The answer was no. And how could you say no? Wouldn't you want everlasting peace, ultimate forgiveness, fulfilling our destiny as people who can love each other and build a world of joy in heaven? I mean, wouldn't you want that? Why would you say no? It's such a weird thing to me. Even when I was an atheist, if you asked me if I wanted there to be a God who cares and loves for us, and will give us everlasting life. Yeah, who wouldn't? Of course I would. I just didn't believe it was true. But to say that I would rather push up daisies in the ground and have no future, that's so weird to me. But why are we fighting all the time? And he says that our absence of knowledge is what causes us to not obey him, that we don't know. And I think that's in, in the end. They don't know what God wants from us, and they w- don't know what he holds for us, the love he holds for us. And if he knew that love, maybe they would feel differently about it. He brings up the point that we are all unique. Every family, every person, we have been built by our creators. Now that we understand DNA, it's so funny how unique we really are because we are a mix of our parents. We like some things, some things are genetic, some things are being raised in a certain way which means this entire planet is a mixed bag of marbles. We're all so different. And that God, too, reveals to us his ways and how different he is. He speaks to every single one of them, no matter how different we are. There is a particular aspect of God that speaks to us. And so I think his view about God and having this multi-dimension person who can reveal himself in the Bible to every single person on this planet and mean something. That's amazing. And he brings up this interesting point, and this kind of got me thinking quite a bit about how, you know, we have God the Father, creator, (laughs) person who spoke to Moses, and God the Son, who the apostles knew and walked with, and then God the Spirit, which is so hard for us to understand. But this is a God without body, can go anywhere, brings the life, brings conviction of our souls, speaks to us. But we think about God so limited. It's so funny to me because they'll say, well, I don't think God could control this war, or I don't think God wants to help us in this way or that way. And what's interesting is God created the whole universe, everything. Everything in this entire universe, this immense place we can't even see from end to end or from the beginning of the time till now, has been created by him. All the systems, all the planets, the black holes, the quantum physics, all those things, the DNA inside our bodies, we see God as so limited. And he said that it's almost like a person pulling up a cup of water on the side of the ocean and saying, I have the ocean in my hands. You can't possess God. You can't hold him in a cup of water. And just like a cup is just a little bit of the whole ocean, we don't even know the whole complexity of God. And yet we think he can't do things or he can't be caring for us. And isn't it amazing that a God that can make a planet so far away, we will never see it, can also be the God who loves us 
cares for us and looks at us and wants to forgive us. That is so amazing. I, I just love that whole idea of it. And he gives this analogy, which I liked, about, you know, a boy flying a kite. And the kite's so far up, you can't even see the kite anymore. And someone asks him, well, how do you know the kite is still there? And then the boy says, every once in a while, I feel a tug, and I know for sure it's there. It's how we know about God, too, that God is so immense that we have to find out, he says, for ourselves and feel those tugs so that we know God is always there at the end of that line. And so people always ask the question, and of course, if God is so good, why is there so much evil in the world? You know, how, how could this have happened when God created us for something so much more? And he says that you'll find that people will say, you know, the creation story is all just a myth, that we were meant to live harmoniously, the world is getting better. But instead, Adam was perfect. God made him perfect. God made Eve perfect. And gave freedom of choice. With that choice, a bad choice was made. Because if we can't choose, we're robots. We're just androids walking around doing God's will without any ability to choose. That freedom to choose is what allows us to be who we are. And that choice determines who we're going to be and whether we're going to find peace with God or if we're going to live at odds with God. And it's almost like trying to pet a cat backwards, right? <laughs> you pet a pet and there's a direction to go or we can decide we're going to just go and pet the wrong way, go the wrong way. And everything in our life will then be unnatural because we're fighting the very nature of the planet, of the entire universe. And he said that when a kid comes back from the university and says that, I no longer feel like the Bible and faith in God is for me. He said a parent can tell that child, that is your freedom. And you're taking that freedom in a terrible direction, but your freedom to make. When we have the story of our lives, it could be pleasant in God's love that we can have the joy that God gives us, or we can live fighting every ounce of nature on this planet, fighting every place we go with the world that God created and be in this constant battle to throw away the things that God offers us. Or we can live that life that God has given us and live that purpose that Adam and Eve were created to live in. He said that every day we would make the same mistakes Adam made, Eve made. We think, well, you mean we have to live in this world because two people screwed up? No, we're going to screw up too. We would make those same choices if we had the choice to do it. We still do it today. We still make those corrupted choices. And so in the end, he says that we blame the creator. We say, well, this is God's fault that we sinned. He set up the situation where we couldn't win. But is that true? Or is it true that God created us to be in this perfect, wonderful place? The devil, the fallen angel, tempted us out of it. And we went along with it. He says that we blame the creator. And so you can argue about why human tragedy happens, by why children still suffer, why these horrible things still happen, and the inability of science or politics to fix those problems. And then we'll blame each other. Oh, well, you don't believe in science enough, or you don't believe my side of politics. And that's why we can't have the good things in life. But in the end, it's God the Creator who built this place to be wonderful. And it is the corrupter, Satan, the fallen angels, and then us who fell in line with the wrong side. And so we're going to be at those odds till we join him in heaven, where we're going to live that life of joy without suffering. So my challenge to you is think this week about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. How does this complexity of God being three parts, but one God, so meaningful to us, how does that help us live in our Christian walk? And what does each part of God offer us in faith as we walk in this world and try to find peace with God? 
All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember to subscribe to the podcast. You can go to the website and it shows all the different services that are hooked up to this podcast. If you have any questions about it, any technical questions, or you have questions about any of the books I've read, reviewed, talked about, please let me know. And remember, trying to search out God's nature and what he wants from us starts with small steps. <laughs>